We're going to be working on the Chapter 5 exercises. We're going to start with Exercise 1. This has two parts to it. And my hope is that I can maybe do this all in the same program. Uh, it says, write the following functions and provide a program to test them. So notice, they're, they're basically telling you that parts A and B are functions, and there's one program. So it's going to all be combined into one. So let's go ahead and bring up our uh, IDE here. I do have a spider up on the screen. Um, does that font look a little small to you guys? Should I maybe bump it up a notch? Looks a little small to me. Is that too big or is that all right? I, you guys are nodding. So I'm, I'm going to say that's okay. Let's go with that size. All right. Uh, I do have an untitled program here that's open. So I'm going to go ahead and do a save as on it. Uh, I'm going to end up in my, my Google Drive where I typically do. And I do have a folder for fall. And we are going into chapter five, so I'm just going to go ahead and create a uh, chapter five folder. And then I'm going to store my work inside there. This, of course, is exercise five underscore one dot pi. And let's look at those instructions one more time. It says, write the following functions and provide a program to test them. So it, it says I should write a function called this and a function called that, right? Def smallest and def average. You know what? Why don't I just start by copying those? How does that sound? Why type if you don't have to? So I know I'm going to define those. So let's go ahead and, and put those in. Uh, now it's kind of expecting that I'm going to finish the rest of it right now, but I'm not going to. All right. Um, and then I'm going to also copy the other one over for def average. And remember that little thing we just did in the lecture? Temporarily, we can just make these into stubs. And I'm just going to return a string on each one until I actually get the logic typed in here? Why not, right? The other thing that I'm going to do that we haven't done quite yet is we are going to start using a main function uh, to do our work. So I'm going to come right up here to the top and I'm just going to define main, empty parentheses on this, and a semicolon. The job of main will be to run the other parts of the program, right? Now, here's how my brain thinks on this stuff. Notice, um, in the book, the way they're listing this, write the following functions and provide a program to test them. So this one's going to return the smallest of the arguments. Now, we've already done some code like this where we've, without using one of the built-in functions, where we can figure out what the smallest or largest number is out of a group of numbers. And when you're sending in three, it's like you compare two, then you compare the next two, et cetera, and then you kind of get the, the result. And with the other one, we're going to get the average, and the average is pretty easy. You just add them together, divide by the number of them, and return the value, right? So those seem pretty easy to me. And the, and the way that we're going to display the stuff is we're going to print a statement that shows what happened and, and what you know, the result is. The way that my brain works is I always try to attack the simplest problem first. And when I look at this problem, to me, the simplest problem is to do the average first. All right? That, that's what my brain is telling me. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I, I think I can figure out how to calculate an average. In fact, let's create a variable called AVG that's going to hold it. And the way that I would do this is I would take the three values coming in, x, y, and z, 
right? And just to be on the safe side, I'm putting them in parentheses, and I'll show you why in a second. And I'm just going to add them together. And then I'm going to divide that by the total number of items I have, which is 3. It's always going to be 3 because that's what this function does. So what would I be returning? Yep, the AVG, the average. All right. So in order to test that, I would just probably simply do a print statement. And you know what? Testing it once, in my mind, is just basically not enough. So what I'm going to do is this. So for the main function there, I'm just going to say the average of 1, 2, and 3 is and then you can see I put in commas, a call to that method, which is going to return a value, it's going to return that value right back to this spot and print it on the screen. Testing it once is not enough. What's the average of 1, 2, and 3? Yeah, what's the average? If I average 1, 2, and 3, what's the average? I add them together. 1 plus 2 plus 3 is, divide by 3 is 2. 2 is right in the middle. That's an easy one, folks. What's the average of 10, 10, and 10? Uh, 10? <laughs> right, so we kind of know the answers. Let's go ahead and see if it works so far. So what I'm going to do here at the end in order to test this, I have to call the main method, or the main function. I, I'm sorry, I always think Java, so... Um, so I'm calling main at the end and it will run. All right, let's save this and let's hit uh, the run button and see what happens down in the console. The average of 1, 2, and 3 is 2. The average of 10, 10, and 10 is 10. Okay, I think we're okay. You guys agree? All right, let's do the smallest and let's see if we can figure out the logic here. We are going to end up returning something. There's no doubt about that. All right. Here's a simple little bit of logic and see if you can follow along. If is where I'm going to start, and I'm going to start checking the first two numbers. I'm going to check to see if x is less than or equal to y. Is x less than or equal to y? And is x less than or equal to z? In that scenario, I'm just going to return x because if x is smaller than y and x is smaller than z, it's the smallest one, right? Right. How about this scenario? If y is less than or equal to x, and y is less than or equal to z. Y is smaller than both of those. Guess what? We're returning y because y is clearly the smallest. See the logic here, folks? And if neither one of those return statements hits, what do we return? x isn't the smallest, y isn't the smallest, so which one is the smallest? Z. So notice how this is a really good example of branching. So if X ends up being the smallest, we return and we're out. If Y ends up being the smallest, we return and then we're out. If neither one of those conditions catches, Z is the only option left. See the thinking? It's pretty simple. All right. So in order to test this, we then need to write a little bit of code to do some testing. I'm going to put mine here. So I have some pre-written ones here where I'm sending the numbers in in three different orders. And what should the result of each one of these be? Well, with the first one, the result should be one is the smallest because x is smallest. One, 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 and one are the smallest. 
And for the last one, two is the smallest, right? You see how they're kind of checking all the scenarios? Save your work. Hit the run button. Let's see if we're, if we're good. We are, right? We sure are. All right, so that's the first exercise, folks. That's 5.1. Really not too bad. Could have been much more challenging. But it does demonstrate to you a couple of different ways to create functions. Both of these are returning values, and they're sending the values back over to where they're being called from. We're also employing uh, the main function here with a call to it at the bottom. It's a really common technique. All right, let's jump back over to the book and move on to the next exercise. Okay, the next one says, write the following functions and provide a program to test them. So kind of the same scenario. It's one program, but we're building three functions into it. And these look like they're just kind of like a ramp up on what we already did. So we have all the same, all different, and sorted. All right, so let's go ahead and start building that. I'm actually going to do a save as on this. You know what, let's do save copy as. And let's call this copy 5.2. That is the next exercise, right? I think. That'd be great if I did an exercise I didn't even assign. Right. Yeah, 5-2. Now, the reason I did that uh, is not by mistake, because I'm seeing a pattern here, and I don't want to, like, kind of recreate the wheel each time. So I know that I'll, I'll probably keep a main method. Okay, and I'm probably going to follow the same technique here, given the fact that the book, I mean, these methods look a lot the same. They're all taking X, Y, Z. We're checking this time, instead of smallest and average, we're checking all the same, all different, or sorted. So the layout's not going to be that much different. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of clear these out rename them and kind of work from there. In fact, I'm going to copy this first one and I know I'm going to have three different functions in here so now it's just a matter of naming them. First one is all the same. The second one is all different. And the third one is sorted. Now let's go ahead and start writing what these might do. How do we check and see if three numbers are all the same? Well, if somebody typed in one, two, three, You got it, right? So if those are all equal, then they're all equal, and we will return. And see, I already have a return statement here, so I can just type it in like this. What will we return? return. True, maybe? Yeah. Right? Are, are they all the same? True. Yes, they are. If they're not, then what? Return false. See how easy that is to write? How about all 
uh, different. And, and here's, like a, here's what the author is doing too, just so you know, right? If you really want to be persnickety about this stuff, he's putting in a, a method definition like this. I think for a program this simple, it's a little bit of overkill. For a more complex program, totally appropriate. Just giving you the example so that you have it. All right, so let's do the one that's all different. We could kind of follow this approach, right? Right, very good, very good. So instead of like checking to see if they're equal, we're checking to see if they're not equal. If it's if x is not equal to y and x is not equal to z, does that cover all the scenarios? No, it doesn't. We're missing one. And y does not equal z. Right? That covers all three scenarios. So if they're not equal, then we return true because they are all different. Otherwise, we will return false, meaning at least some of them are the same. Let's write the final uh, method here. So this one is sorted and here we have to put them in order. That's a little bit different kind of scenario. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, the way I, I read this is you could read it that we're going to, are we sorting them or are we checking to see if they're sorted? Let's see what the instructions say. Write the following and provide a program to test them. Returning true, see, I tell you what to return if the arguments are sorted with the smallest one coming first. So we're just checking to see if they're in order. So that's pretty simple. So all we have to say if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to z, that would cover the sorting. If that's the case, then we will return true, otherwise we return false. Now we just need to write the code to test them all. And you know what, we're probably just gonna follow this, this pattern that we have here, but you know what, since I have code that I can copy from, I'm not gonna refrain from doing that. Why would I, right? Here's an example for testing all the same. So we're sending in one, two, and three. There's only one of these that fits the scenario of, of them being all the same, correct? For all different, do something like that. And then finally, for sorted, we can do something like this. And the, the point here is that the output message is showing us what's going in to each function. And as it's coming back, we then um, see if it's calculating everything correctly. I'm going to go ahead and run this. And I know you guys are, are busily copying code. And I'm not trying to rush you, but I'm going to create a little more space here in my console, make sure my stuff is saved. And I'm not sure if I might need to give it a little more breathing room here. Let's go ahead and run. And are the outputs correct? Looks like they're all correct to me. All right. 
So that gives us a little bit of practice calling functions, creating functions, and then putting stuff into a main method and uh, triggering the main method. So this, this approach that you see here is a real common one in Python program development in terms of that main function. All right, let's uh, jump back over to the book and figure out our next exercise here. It's going to be exercise 5.3. All right, kind of following in the same fine tradition here. Write the following functions and provide a program to test them. And in this case, we're going to uh, get the first digit, the last digit, and the number of digits uh, in the argument. All right, so we need to do a little bit of work here to get this going. So let's start. Um, I think I'm just going to create one from scratch this time. So we'll do a new file. We'll do a save as. And then we're going to call it exercise53.py. All right. Now we have a little bit of work to do. We have three different uh, functions that we need to create. Um, and I think we'll be okay with most of this. I anticipate a couple of issues, so we'll figure that out as we go. Uh, but let's start by creating a, a main function first. Let's get that out of the way so we can do that. Uh, the other thing that we'll probably want to do is way at the bottom somewhere is we want to throw in a call to main so we don't forget to do it. And it, that's one thing that you might run into um, when you first do this is you might forget to put that in. So hopefully that won't be the case for you. The other methods we need to create are first digit, last digit, and digits. I think I can remember that, so I'm just going to type them in. So I'm going to define first digit. And if I remember right, we were passing number n to it. We'll create another one called last digit. And another one called just digits. Digits. All right, now we can start uh, building each one of these. All right, so we're going to let somebody type in a number. We're going to assume that the number that they type in is of a certain size. Okay? And, and actually, they're not asking us to get the input from the user at all at this point. They're just asking us to, to test some numbers. So we're going to figure out one to test. All right, so if we feed a number in, we need to look at the first digit. How do we do that? Well, the first thing I would do is I would read that number in to a variable. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create one called string, because it just makes sense to me to do it that way. And I'm going to convert whatever that number is into a string. Because in order to, to pick out individual characters in a number, we have to first convert it to characters, which is why we put it inside the string method. It converts it into a string. So we're going to take that number, convert it into a string, then store it in string. From there, we just basically need to look at position 0 of the string, which we, we do with this syntax, right? But then we also because we want to put it back up on the screen as a number, I'm going to create a variable to hold that. I'm going to call it first, and I'm going to convert that string back to an int. 
Okay, so do I really have to do the conversion? I, I mean, I'll argue that, no, you really you kind of don't have to because you can print it either way. Um, but to me, it seems a little cleaner to do it like this. So that's how I do first digit. I would grab it, convert it to a string. Once it's a string, I can look at the individual characters. I just pull from position zero. I convert whatever's in there back to an int, sort in a variable, and return it to where it came from. Let me show you another really crafty little thing to do. How do we figure out the last digit of a number? Well, I could use the same technique that I just did, right? I could convert it to a string, then I could look at its length, and then subtract one from the length and pull the last character from the last array position. That's one way to do it. Let me show you a more clever way with numbers. If I take a number, and the number that the author always uses is 1729, right? If I divide that by 10, what's the answer? It's pretty simple. You just get rid of the last digit. That's divide by 10. If I mod this by 10, which is I'm looking for the remainder, what's the answer? 9. Isn't that a clever way to do it? That is a really clever way to do it. I love it. All right. So the, the answer is really as simple as this. You can just do a straight up return and just say n mod 10. That will give you the last digit regardless of whatever base 10 number you throw at it. Isn't that just awesome? I think it's awesome. That's assuming an integer. I always love it when you get like Super simplistic. Isn't this an indented block? See, it's giving me an error message. Hmm. All right, well, I guess I'm not too worried about it. All right, let's try the last one now. With the last one, we're just going to count the number of digits. Well, how about we first convert that to a string so we can, you know, because if it's a string, we can actually count them. Right? Right. And then how do I get a count? All I have to do is check the length, right? I can just use the length function. That'll tell me how long it is. How many digits? Well, how long is it? That's how long it is. It's almost too simple, right? It is. It's actually very simple code, folks. That's kind of the beauty of it all. And I, I'm trying to uh, figure out why. Oh, I don't have any main stuff called. That's why. Now we need to write some code to test each one of them. So I'm just going to kind of proceed one at a time here. And let's do, uh, for first digit, we could do something kind of like this. Wait, it does not like my indents, does it? I wonder if other IDEs handle this a little more elegantly. Those of you that are Visual Studio users, you should know that Visual Studio's got Python as an option as well. All right, so that's how we're gonna test the first one. Let's test the second one. And basically what these are at this point is I'm just going to copy the same block of text. Twice. And then I'm just changing it, right?
and then we should change it here as well. And the last one is called digits. Like so. All right, so here's our completed program, folks. It's all code. Assuming that it works. Now, I'm also looking at the author's solution on my second screen, and he's got a couple, well, one extra little thing in here, and I'm curious as to why he did it, so we're going to find out if this generates something other than what I expect. Go ahead and do a save, control S, and then I'm going to hit run. And I don't think I found any issues here. First digit of this is one, yup, yup. Last digit, yep, yep, yep. The digits four, one, and three, it seemed to work just fine. That's exercise 5.3. All right, our next exercise is 5.5, and it says write a function, def repeat, string, comma, n, comma, delim, that returns a string repeated n times separated by the string delim. For example, if I were to send repeat ho as a string, three as the number, and then uh, comma space, it's going to print ho, ho, ho. Get it? All right. So let's see if we can uh, create that one. This should actually be kind of a fun one honestly, compared to some of the stuff that we've done. All right, we're going to follow the same uh, pattern here. I'm just going to go ahead and create a new file, save as immediately into my Chapter 5 folder. This will be Exercise 5.5. Five. We are going to create a main function, so why don't we do it like this? So they want us to write a method called repeat. So let's just go ahead and do that. So let's define it, a repeat. And then they want us to pass into it string n and delim. All right. I find it curious the way this IDE behaves, like almost like they want me to type something in just to have something. Yeah, see, you almost kind of have to force it to do its indenting. All right. So in order for this to now do what it needs to do, I want to take that string that's coming in and I don't necessarily want to change it, but then again, what I'm going to output is going to be, in essence, what's in it. And so I'm thinking I need like a secondary placeholder for something. So that string, I'm just going to take it right away and I'm going to put it into, I don't know. The author calls it this, and I'm trying to figure out why. Retval. Okay, it doesn't mean anything to me, but I'm going with it. So I'm going to store the string there. Maybe return value. Okay, that, that's probably what it is. All right. And then what he does is he sets up a, a loop, and he does this. He goes, for i in range, 1, comma, n. How many times do you want this to repeat is really what this is. The n is how many times. 
every time we do that, we are going to take the string that we've built so far, add to it the string again, plus the delimiter, plus the new string coming in. So it keeps adding back to itself. When we're all done, we will return the return value, whatever the, you know, the outcome is, basically. Now, in order to get this to work, we are asking the user, I think it said, to write a function that returns a string repeated, blah, 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 for example. All right. Now, one part that I'm, I'm kind of reading into this a little bit, frankly, is that I'm not really sure how you're going to do this without allowing the user to input some information. So I'm prompting my users, folks, all right? So I'm going to say input string equals input, and I'm going to say enter a string, like so. I'm also going to ask the user from a prompt again, how many times? Or how many repetitions is maybe a better way to say it. You know what? To me, that seems like it needs to be a number, right? It does. And the reason it does is because in the for loop below, they want a number to go in to run the loop. And that's what's going to end up in this spot here. So we need to convert it into a number. Finally, the delimiter, you guys know what a delimiter is? It's a separator. So when we say comma separated values, the delimiter is a comma. Yeah. That's the one that's kind of setting up the parameters here. And we're going to ask the user input separated by question mark like so and then they can type in whatever they want once we have that information then we will issue a print command calling on the repeat method or function and we're going to throw at it input string what we want to repeat, how many times it will repeat, and whatever the separator is for it, just like that. Now, I once again have these, yeah, you got to spell, spell these things right. There we go. But you see how that misspelling throws you off? And then I, you just hover over the mistake. That's kind of an on-the-fly debugging, folks. And hopefully they go away. You think this is enough to make it work? It sure is. Let's give it a shot. Let's hit the run button. Enter a string. Wow. How many repetitions? Five seems good. Separated by, I don't know, how about an ampersand? Oh, better yet. Would that work? 
Oh, I can't backspace here. I might want to actually do something like this. Because I gotta actually send a string in, I can't just send a character. And now I'm looking at wow. We'll see how this works. Not exactly what I expected, but it did work. Not exactly what I expected. <laughs> so therefore, not very good. It's all in like what you enter. Let me try that again. Seems to be working okay. All right, last exercise uh, for us is uh, 5.7, and this one is write a function, def count words with the string thrown in, that returns a count of all words in the string, string, that's confusing, words are separated by spaces, for example, Count words, Mary had a little lamb, should return five. All right, let's see if we can build that. All right, let's go back over to Spider and create a new program. Do a save as. This is five, seven. All right, let's start by calling main at the bottom here, and let's go ahead and define main like so. I'm, I'm curious as to how this auto indents. I'm still not comfortable with it, frankly. All right, and it's going to be called Def count words string. Let's just copy that in verbatim and get our colon in there. All right. So I guess the first thing that we need to do is to make sure if somebody is typing in a string. So we're going to get this from the keyboard. You know what? That kind of answers my first question. So first thing I'm going to do in my main method is I'm going to get that input string again just like we did in the last program, and I'm just going to say input, enter a string. Like so. All right, but if I'm getting a string from the keyboard, the one thing I might want to do is I might want to make sure that it's what I call sanitized. So you can do this, this special little method, and I think they mentioned it in one of the previous chapters, called strip. And when we work in Java, we use one called trim that does basically the same thing. That removes any leading or trailing spaces from the code, or from what the user entered. So if the user accidentally hit space and then typed their name in, or as a lot of people do because they, they're in this, this habit of like typing, Every time they type a word, they hit space at the end, right? It's not a bad idea to run a, a little method like this to clean that stuff out. Leading or trailing spaces, and, and those are removed by doing that. So once we have that going, let's make sure that they're not typing in a blank string, right? Because what if they just press enter, right? So let's handle that scenario right away. Let's say if string equal equal empty quotes, then we will return zero. And notice how I just did that all in one line. Why? Because I can. Right? It makes for really nice concise code. I love it. All right. Now we need to figure out, what, what's the whole point of this? 
we're counting the number of words in a string. How do you figure out how many words there are in a string? I mean, it's really subjectively now. If I was like, for example, just to look at a string of text, which is a series of words separated by spaces, how do I know where one word ends and one begins? Wait, what? If you're looking at a sentence, how do I know where one word begins and the next word, or one word ends and the next word begins? Yeah, the spaces are kind of the, the key. So to me, it would make sense to count the spaces, right? So think about this. If I had a sentence like, how many repetitions, right? If I start counting the spaces, I can count one, two, and then all I have to do is add one and I got three words. See my, my simple logic? So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna set up a variable next to do a count. I am just gonna preset it to one because I assume I'll find at least one word in there or one space. Because if the string was empty, we already would be returned out. So my thinking is we have at least one space in there and at least two words. All right, so at this point, what I would do is I would start checking the characters in the string. So I'm gonna put in the for loop that says, for character in string, if the character is equivalent to a space, so I'm actually typing in a space inside of double quotes, then the count will be increased by one. So it's gonna take a whole sentence that we type in. Every time it hits its space, it adds a count. We started at the number one because we've already identified the fact that a sentence will have one more word than at those spaces. And then all we have to do is return the count to call it a day. That's gonna be outside the for loop, so we backspace, and we just simply return the count. Like so. Now, I did ask the user for input to get a string, but now I actually need to process that string. So what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna do a print statement that's gonna give me a little bit of output, and it says the string contains And then we call the method, which is count words. We're gonna to send to it the input string that we got from the user. And then we're gonna to add to the end of it words, like so. The string contains five words, just for example. That would be our output. This tiny little bit of code here accomplishes all that um, pretty elegantly, I think. Go ahead and do a control S to save, and then feel free to run the program. All right, so it's gonna say enter a string. How many words I got there? Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. So that's five, is that nine words? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna press enter. Yay, nine words. Pretty amazing. So it's really kind of a combination of a lot of different logic pieces here. Really what we're seeing in this one little simple program, for as simple as it is, we have functions, we have the main function, we have uh, input from the keyboard, output to the screen, we're running a loop, we're doing math, we're doing string processing, and we're doing decision statements all at the same time.
This is kind of a grand combination of all your skills that you've learned so far. For as simple as the program seems, it's actually, you got a lot going on. All right, folks, that ends the exercises for this chapter. And that will also end this video. So this video ends here. Uh, if you are working on the extra credit, uh, good luck with that. Uh, and if you need any extra help on it, just let me know and I'm, I'm glad to guide you.